Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Solid State Physics in a Nutshell podcast series. My name's Eric. And I'm Emily. We've made these videos to go with Cattell's Solid State Physics book, and our hope is that these videos will provide you with a resource that you can watch over and over until your heart's content. Also, Stephen Simon has a book out as well that's quite nice. We'll denote those references with an S. Okay, often in solid state, we care about properties, stuff like magnetism and superconductivity. But to get to these properties, we need to understand the underlying structure of solids. So slow down. Before we even get to talk about structure and properties, we need to understand why atoms coalesce into solids in the first place. So we're talking about bonding then? Yeah. And if we're going to talk about why you and I and everything else doesn't just fly apart, we need to think about the energy change associated with bond formation. Then, in later videos, we can look in detail at specific types of bonding and extend these ideas to solids. So, can we get away with talking about bonding from a classical perspective? Well, we're going to treat bonds like classical springs later in class, but to really understand the root of what holds atoms together, we're going to need some quantum mechanics. Okay, I can handle a little quantum. Where do you want to start? Well, let's start with a single hydrogen atom. I can't really imagine a simpler case. What assumptions do you want to make? Well, we know the electron is way lighter than the proton. Yeah, by about a factor of a thousand. <laughs> then we can assume that the nucleus is stationary compared to the electron, and this allows us to separate the wave functions of the proton and the electron. This is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Today we're focused on the electron wave function. Since we're assuming the proton is fixed in space, the associated potential from the proton's charge is time invariant. Well, that's pretty nice. Okay, so we're looking at the electron's wave function. Let's define the ground state wave function of the hydrogen atom as phi. Now, just to make sure we're all on the same page, we're going to be using the Dirac notation in this class. And we can define a Hamiltonian for the system, H0. This Hamiltonian isn't so bad. We're going to separate it into a kinetic part and a potential part. Is the potential part just the Coulomb well created by the nuclear charge? Yep. Within the time-independent Schrodinger equation, we can solve for the energy of this single atom by taking the inner product with phi. And with a little rearrangement, here we go. And with a little extra effort, we could show the wave function looks roughly like this. That derivation is straight out of quantum 1, so let's leave it alone. Agreed. We could have also looked at higher energy wave functions as well, but for today, we're going to focus on the ground state wave function. All right, that wasn't so bad. Let's add a proton. So you want to make an H2 plus molecule? Yep. Now, where do you expect to find the electron? Intuitively, I'd expect the electron to want to sit between the two protons. Let's start by describing the electron's wave function in the H2 plus molecule as a linear combination of the original atomic wave functions phi. And here, you've got the A and the B denoting the left and right atoms. True. Let's make one assertion about the isolated wave functions. Let's make them orthogonal to each other. Okay, then if the original wave functions were normalized, we can write the following. So at this point, we haven't explicitly defined the isolated wave functions, nor the coefficients Ca or Cb. Nor have we said anything about the new Hamiltonian H that describes the molecular system. We could take a guess at the Hamiltonian. We've still got the kinetic term, but now we've got a second potential term. And together, the potential should look like this. And the time-independent Schrodinger equation should look like this. Despite these terms being fairly loosely defined at this point, we can still solve for a general expression for the energy of the electron in the molecule. Let's start by putting this expression for psi into the time-independent Schrodinger equation. That's a mess. Let's see if we can come up with a way to clean it up. Remember when we took the inner product to find the energy of the electron in the isolated hydrogen atom? Sure. Well, let's create two separate equations called secular equations by taking the inner product with phi a and phi b. Okay, here's the first one. When there's an operator between the bra and the ket, we can't pull it out, but a scalar-like energy can be. Provided phi a was normalized, this term would go to 1. Hmm, this is pretty gross. Is there anything we can do with the orthogonality of the phi's to simplify this down? So let's go back to our original equations for each isolated atom. If you take the inner product with phi a, 
we find one of them goes to zero and the other goes to the energy of the isolated atom. Cool. Going back to the H2 plus molecule, we can do some substitutions and get this fairly simplified expression. And by the same argument, we can take the inner product of the other phi and get this expression. Yep, everything's transposed nicely. Okay, so we've got two equations. Our initial goal was to figure out the energy of the wave functions, but this still looks like a mess. The problem is these coefficients CA and CB. At this point, we have no idea what they are. Hmm, let's see if we can separate them out of the solution. Okay, I'm thinking we start by pulling all of our terms to one side, so each equation equals zero. Then you can write these two equations in matrix form like this. Hmm, seems like one solution is just to set CA and CB equal to zero. Yes, but in this case you can't normalize the wave function psi, so that solution doesn't make any sense. Hmm, scratch that one then. Okay, from linear algebra, we know that if the determinant of the matrix equals zero, then the whole expression is true. Let's take the determinant and solve for energy. And here we go with a little help from Mathematica. Let's take a look at these terms. We've got special names for them. This term is the Coulomb potential felt by orbital A from nucleus B. We call it the cross term. The other term is called the hopping term. Hmm, I'm not seeing the hopping. Yeah, fair enough. That's because we're looking at the time-independent solution. If we solve the full time-dependent solution, we'd see the charge density oscillate back and forth between the two atoms. So that coupling is then described by this hopping term? Maybe you'll feel better if we think about the limit where the atoms are really far apart. Then this hopping term goes to zero, and the charge density rarely moves between the two atoms. Also in that limit, the cross term goes to zero. Then, the energy is just the original, isolated atom energy. Okay, enough of this. Let's, let's bring the atoms back together. Since we have this plus minus in the expression, it looks like we have two energies for the electron. And with these two energies, you can show that there are two molecular wave functions psi. One of these has CA equal to CB, and the other has CA equal to negative CB. When we look at the first case, where CA equals CB, the atomic wave functions would look like this. This is the low energy case. We can look at the electron density by plotting psi star psi, and it looks like there's a significant electron density between the two nuclei. That sounds just like you expected from your intuition. The electron is helping screen the two protons from each other. Since this is the low energy case, it sounds like we're describing bonding. Exactly. And we can look at the other solution that's at higher energy. With the sign switch, the total wave function looks like this. The electron density must have a node in between the two nuclei. Yeah, this node looks kind of crazy. We're basically saying that the electrons would rather be outside of the two nuclei rather than in between them. But that's why this is the higher energy solution. This must be the antibonding case. If we plot these two energies as a function of inner nuclear distance, we'll get the following curves for the bonding and antibonding cases. So when the atoms are far away, we can see the electron energies just have the isolated atom value, and as we bring them closer together, the bonding and antibonding splitting increases. But for short distances, this curve is busted. If this were actually true, all of matter would just collapse in on itself. Hmm, that doesn't sound so awesome. What's broken at these short distances? Well, we didn't include a Coulomb repulsion term between the two nuclei, and our assumption about the orthogonality of the wave functions will break down as well. If we include these effects, the electron energies increase substantially and we get the following curve. Cool. It seems like there's a minimum on this bonding curve, suggesting that this is the equilibrium bond distance. Exactly. That's an important idea. And the depth of this well shows how stable the bond is. So basically the energetic penalty you'd have to pay if you pulled the two nuclei apart. So that covers the most important concepts that the H2 plus molecule can teach us today. Let's do a quick recap. Sure. The point of the video was to consider what drives atoms to form bonds. Using a linear combination of the atomic orbitals and a simple Hamiltonian, we found a general expression for the energy of the system. We saw the difference between bonding and antibonding orbitals, both from an energy perspective and from a wave function perspective. We also saw that there's some well-defined length to these bonds. 
This understanding is going to set the stage for considering bonding in more complicated systems. But that's for other videos. Okay, sounds good. Thanks for watching Solid State Physics in a Nutshell. See you next time.